This year's topic is racial, sexual, and gender diversity in organized religions. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to our panelists, Dr. Keisha McKenzie, Imam Dai Abdullah, and Jessica Cherry Heiss. We are excited and honored to have them here to share with us their diverse perspectives and experiences as members of the Muslim, Jehovah's Witness, and Seventh-day Adventist religions. Dr. Sel Huang uh, will serve as moderator and discussant today, so I will now turn things over to them. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Professor Kissendanner. And so my name is Sel Wong. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today. Thank you all so much for coming. According to a study by the Pew Research Group, um, and by the way, I'm, my name is Sel Wong. I'm Assistant Professor of Women and Gender Studies. According to a study by the Pew Research Group in 2015, the three most racially diverse religions are one, Seventh-day Adventist, two, Muslim, or Islam, and three, Jehovah's Witnesses. And so if you're interested in bringing up the same chart, you know, you can just Google Pew Research Group Most race, Racially Diverse Religions. So this panel will feature three, three speakers of diverse genders and sexual orientations from each of these three religions who will discuss their lives and experiences in their respective religions. This panel will be organized in that each speaker will present, and then at the end, we'll have a Q&A you know, with all three speakers. So our first speaker is Dr. Keisha McKenzie. Um, Dr. Keisha McKenzie is program, program officer at Auburn, a multi-faith leadership development center that equips leaders of faith and moral courage pursuing social justice. Educated in the UK, Jamaica, and West Texas, Keisha has worked across the US as a communication development strategist, faith organizer, board member, and speaker. So let's welcome Dr. Keisha McKenzie. Morning, afternoon. Um, I think I wanted to start with a proverb, don't cut down the tree that gives you shade. And it represents my orientation to the faith in which I grew up. Uh, I see myself now as an adult child in that tradition. So someone who's connected to the tradition, but aware of its various positives and negatives and responsible for how I improve on what I was given. So I grew up in Southeast London um, in the 80s and 90s in a majority Caribbean immigrant Seventh-day Adventist congregation. I was in my early teens before I even realized that there were ever white Seventh-day Adventists because all of the people in my denomination were black. Almost all of them were Caribbean immigrants to the UK. Um, some of them were from West Africa and North Africa. But it was a, a long, long time before I realized there was any of this ethnic diversity within our tradition, in part because, um, like many religions, uh, Seventh-day Adventism is not exempt from institutional racism and history of xenophobia in any of the territories that it, it participates in. So in the UK, where my parents moved from the islands in the 1960s, um, the Caribbean immigrants came from um, communities that them, themselves had been missionized back in the early 1900s. And so my parents moved from Jamaica to the UK as Seventh-day Adventists, but came into a church that was then indigenous uh, British, English, white. And over the 60s and 70s, that indigenous um, white culture began to move outside of London into the counties. And so as those populations moved out of the city center, the churches themselves became less white and more immigrant. And so by the time I was born in the 1980s, as I say, almost all of the people around me were Caribbean, were black, um, from either the Commonwealth or other parts of the world. I was very, very um, much surrounded by strong lay leadership church culture. So the language of laity is anybody who is not clergy. And um, within that population of lay leaders, there were many, many strong female leaders. So it was a very long time again before I ever saw any sort of conflict between being a strong female leader and being an active church member. But while I was in uh, my early teens, I chose to be baptized 
and the year before I was baptized, the global church of now about 21 million people in 183 plus countries around the world had decided that women could not be ordained elders. So that happened in 1995, but I was uh, 12 or 13 at the time, and I didn't really know that was the wider politics that was going on. Because in my local context, women were participating as uh, not ministers, but as teachers, as organizers of the scouting troop, um, as choir leaders, as directors of the community services ministries, and many other unofficial power roles within the denomination, and within, within, the, within the congregation, that is. I didn't have a female minister until I was about mid-20s, and I didn't recognize my own call to ministry until about five years later. So I think there's a, a whole number of layers there around who is visible to you in the local context versus what are the power dynamics happening in the system around you, and uh, how sometimes you might be shielded by ignorance and by really positive local experiences from the dynamics that are happening in the world around you. So I, I would say I now express my call through my day job at Auburn Seminary, which started about 200 years ago in upstate New York City as a Presbyterian, um, a Presbyterian degree granting seminary that trained ministers to go out into what they called the frontier at that time. And we now know through understanding how, um, how churches engaged Native American people that, that that was not a frontier. People actually lived there. And people had their own historical and cultural traditions there and religious traditions there. But Auburn was at that time part of a mission, missionizing um, uh, educational tradition. And it began um, with training ministers and then in the 1930s moved out from upstate New York into New York City, where it is now. It's turned several times from de granting degrees to ministers to doing continuing education for people of faith and clergy to now we are a social justice organization that enables people of faith and moral courage who are doing social justice, whether that is immigration organizing, anti-poverty organizing, reproductive justice, and a whole spectrum of other things, including LGBTQ organizing. I would say there are a couple of sources of opposition to women and queer folks within my tradition as, as in any other. So some of that is the religious uh, thread. So Seventh-day Adventism, I would class as both fundamentalist and evangelical. Evangelical in the sense that it still considers that it has some good news that other people should know about. And so there's a drive to get that word out. But fundamentalist in the sense that it's anchored in a particular text, uh, that being the Bible, with a, a couple of other um, key people who the tradition uses to interpret what the Bible might say. So that's one strand. The second strand would be socio, sociological and political. So when I grew up in the UK, Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister of England. And under her leadership, there was a law, a local administration law that said that schools could not teach anything other than um, heterosexuality in classes. And so for the entire period between the late 1970s and 2003, schools could not teach about gay people. Schools could not teach about transgender identity. And so for all of that period, there was a whole swathe of young people who grew up not really having quality language or ways of interpreting their own gender experience or their own sexuality or the sexuality and genders of others. The, second, the third strand, I would say, is cultural. So I said religious opposition, um, sociopolitical opposition, and then cultural opposition. So within uh, the British Jamaican community that I grew up in, we were very much influenced by um, the legacies of British colonialism. So the British colonized Jamaica in the 1600s, 1700s, and uh, Victorian laws became enshrined into what then was Jamaican law. So there are laws still on the books in Jamaica that we are now independent since 1963, 62, um, about that criminalize same-sex conduct between men explicitly in the laws and then indirectly um, soci socially marginalize sexual intimacy and intimate conduct between people of other genders as well. So the law itself only visibilizes men, but the impacts of that affect everybody. And so Adventism is literally a colonial religion. My grandparents converted in the 1930s after the missionaries went to Jamaica in around the 1890s. And my grandfather, as an example, spent 81 years in that tradition before he died last year, 105. 
And so Jamaica kind of grapples with the legacy, like a century plus legacy of what the British imported into the island and navigating the various religious um, fundamentalisms that came in with the missionaries. Where I end up doing most of my work these days is in a very different space. So in part because of my own experience growing up within Seventh-day Adventism, coming to understand my own sexuality and gender as an adult, and then going into advocacy and organizing with other people in my communities, I ended up getting into a bunch of um, reading on my own because my tradition wouldn't teach me these things. Um, and connecting with people outside of the tradition, including Dai, who I realized when we uh, were organizing this panel, I'd met five years ago um, through a different network. And um, I put a couple of these books that helped me go through my process 10 plus years ago. Uh, some of them are the the uh, theology. Some of them are kind of narratives from people who are doing work in their own countries or contexts around the Commonwealth, which is Commonwealth being countries that the British colonized once upon a time are now independent like Canada, India, Jamaica, but are connected by history. Um, or uh, writing or reflections from people in the queer Africas. So there's a contingent of organizers, advocates, artists, writers who um, reflect on their experience through their work and have a reader called the Queer Africa Reader, which is really very, very good. I recommend it. Another a segment of the books that are represented on the table are from people in the US who are from an evangelical background and organize around purity culture. So purity culture is a strand of teachings that talks about applying value to virginity and shame to sexual activity outside of heterosexual marriage. And so there are a lot of people um, in their early 20s, mid 30s to early 40s who have used the internet in the last 10 to 15 years to tell their stories in ways they couldn't do locally in, in local churches and to connect with others to kind of build community power together. And the book Pure is uh, an example of an individual testimony that also lifts up some of these other community stories. And I was able to talk with the author. She has now started a story sharing um, nonprofit and I, I work on her board at the moment. And then uh, one more strand would be uh, a book of papers given at a conference in Jamaica three years ago called Intimate Conviction. And this was a conference that was organized by a lawyer based in Toronto named Maurice Tomlinson, who's a Jamaican who's now in exile in Canada, um, and has done a lot of really dogged organizing around challenging that legacy British law that criminalizes conduct between men. And he organized this panel to put people who are in churches in Jamaica in conversation with people who are queer, LGBTQI, outside of Jamaica and within to talk about ways that the church could move from a space of opposition to the LGBTQ community to a space of nurturing and pastoral care. So many of us who are still rooted in our religious traditions recognize that as much as the church has been oppositional to us, we're st we still have a responsibility to correctly, um, correctly handle the legacy of the spiritual wisdom that we've inherited and to make sure that the church's and religion's footprint on the lives of real people isn't oppressive because it doesn't necessarily have to be oppressive. It can be, and it historically has been in many scenarios, but it doesn't have to be. So there are a lot of us who are thinking about ways that we can take those core values and turn them towards things that are life-giving. So I would say at Auburn, one of the things that we've been doing lately as a team is to think about how to execute that good footprint. And one of the projects that we work on is represented at the back of the room, in a um, research-based messaging guide for how to connect LGBTQ people and conservative Christians, and to explore how conservative Christians' view on sexuality and gender might evolve. And so we have a messaging guide that, if you're in that context at all, might be helpful to you as you think about how to work with them. Um, and then the second project that I wanted to highlight is around reproductive justice. So there are three cohorts now of ordinary folks with zero to five years of organizing experience in Arizona, Phoenix, um, in Louisiana, New Orleans, and in um, Cheyenne, Wyoming. And these are people who we've brought together to connect and to share resources and strategies to think about reproductive justice, which is, as Sister Song defines it, the human right to maintain human bodily autonomy, to have children, 
to not have children and to raise the children that you have in safe and sustainable communities. And I just wanted to share like that spread of being rooted in a very narrowly defined tradition, but being able to go outside of that tradition, connect with others, and build power to make the world better. Thank you. All right, thank you. So our next speaker is Imam Dayi Abdallah. Imam Dayi Abdallah is the executive director of Mecca Institute, a Muslim think tank and online Islamic theological chaplaincy program that teaches an inclusive Quranic liberation theology for Muslims and non-Muslims living in modern, multi-faith and secular societies. Imam Dayi provides pastoral counseling for Muslim youth, adults, their families, and friends. He performs same-sex, opposite-sex, and interfaith marriages for Muslims of diverse backgrounds. So let's welcome Imam Abdallah. Thank you very much, Sal, for inviting me, and thank the panel. Um, of course, I still, here it is now, nearly... 35 years, well, almost 30 years, let's put it that way, 30 years of being out as a Muslim, and I still get people asking me the question, I never knew that there were queer Muslims. It seems strange and unusual, but actually it's because people want to ignore the truth. And part of that process is because they believe in something that in many instances become folklore because the theology is seeped into the culture and then the culture with its taboos and things comes out with an understanding of how the world works. So often people turn to their own culture and not the text to learn about themselves. So uh, I'll just give you a little background about myself and I'll come back to that particular um, thought. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, Motown. I was a young kid during Motown with Aretha Franklin screaming in another ear. Loved it. It was a wonderful time to grow up. The civil rights movement, uh, which was very much supported by the auto industry, blacks who worked in the auto industry and the adjunct um, businesses. And then Islam, the nation of Islam was there as well. This first mosque was built in Detroit. So there was this fermentation of civil rights, quest for freedom, acknowledging our past in America, but also our past of Africa and how we got here. And then from there, a idea that we can become more liberated in terms of who we were as people. So of course things were well. In 1969, I was a senior in high school um, graduating from Martin Luther King High School, which was Eastern High School before we changed its name after Dr. King's assassination. And that June, we had Stonewall. Well, being an, a very uh, open-minded 15-year-old, and there at the school, at the, in the city, they had a station, radio station called WWW, and they had like a morning show uh, that went for people who were commuting. And they had a joke, This uh, the two guys who had they had a joke and they did one about being gay. And so the young man is trying to talk to his father about his partner. And every time he would mention a way to say that he and his partner were lovers, the father would ignore what he's saying. So you say, well, you know, Jack and I were very close and we we're really, you know, we're partners. Well, that's good. It's glad that you have a good business partner. And then he would go on and on and on the father. So this went on for like two minutes in the routine. So the father kept ignoring the truth, kept ignoring the process. So I knew then I had to tell my truth to my parents. Now, at eight years old, as, as a Southern Baptist, I was baptized. And it was then that I realized that this wasn't going to work for me. And so I talked to my parents about it, and they told me, well, the most important thing for you is it's not what faith you practice, but that you have faith for the times when you need to hold on to something. 
So they allowed me to go with my other friends, Detroit being very diverse. I had Jewish, black and Korean friends, people from all over the world who were there for the auto industry. And I learned about other faiths, but nothing really gelled for me, but the exposure was good. And by the time I started to enter college, I knew that metaphysics was the thing for me at that time. I followed that for a while, then got into practicing Buddhism. And eventually, it was not until several years later, after having lived in San Francisco, you heard me right, <laughs> um, being involved in the black gay community there, and then going to Washington, D.C. Uh, during the first March, Gay and Lesbian March on Washington, 1979. And I knew that Washington, D.C. was the black gay mecca, the place for me. So I relocated there, got involved in black gay activism, and it was through that process that I came to understand that we were powerful, that we as LGBTQ people, we had power, individual power, and as long as we didn't give it away to others, we then had a right to use it in a way to further our own personal and community uh, development, political, political or otherwise. In 1983, Three, I went back to school because I had a vision. The vision said, study Chinese. Study Chinese. Well, through my process, I went to Georgetown University and said, I want to study Chinese. They said, oh, we've been waiting for you. I wound up getting a community scholarship as a person who had worked in the community for several years successfully. And they said, but I wanted to change what I wanted to do. So they gave me a full fellowship. And nine months later, I was at Beijing University continuing my studies, and then time in, in Taiwan, came back, did Arabic, and the same thing in the Middle East, a year in Egypt, a year in Jordan, and a year in Syria. It was then that I came back, did law school, and then I went back to the Middle East and worked in Saudi Arabia for several years. And it was there that I did my most intensive study of the Islamic theology. And I kept coming up and finding these alternative opinions that was going on. This scholar would say this, and this scholar would contradict them. This scholar would say, you can't be gay. The other one would say, yes, you can. <laughs> so it was this type of thing of, well, who's what? Who's where? Who's right? And it was through that process that I came to understand the aspect, as I said earlier, that is through each culture, people derive their understanding of the Quranic text. Because not only was I, I became Muslim in China, which is a very unusual place to become Muslim, <laughs> But it was there. But I've traveled to 18 Muslim states, and I've lived in five of them. So part of that process helped me congeal and truly understand that this is what that is, that it is the way in which people think about their religion and what the cultural taboos have taught them what you can and cannot do. And that's not just for LGBTQ, but that's for women's rights or women. That's for how children are supposed to interact, and even the elderly as well. Then, um, in part of that process of coming back um, to, the to the thing that when I came back from Saudi Arabia in, in 1999, um, well, I should say, let me start. In 1994, I was out as a Muslim in the religious community in Washington, D.C. And then in 1999, Faisal Alam started Al Fatiha, which is um, Quranic uh, right for the opening. And that was for LGBTQ Muslims. And I was in Saudi Arabia at the time doing my research, and I contacted him and sent him my research and said, hey, this is what I found. And from that, I eventually became spiritual leader for the queer Muslim community in the United States and expand it uh, beyond that. The, but that also allowed me to do two things. One, to meet with other Islamic scholars who were queer, lesbian, um, gay, and then also to run MGM, Muslim Gay Men, which was an online Yahoo group. And it was there that through my tra additional training with the um, head of the Islamic um, Shura Council, meaning the Islamic Legal Council, who was my mentor for three years, I was able to start taking those, um, what's the word I want to use, those folklore beliefs and to be able to challenge them 
because I had the not, the, not only the linguistic, but also now the scholarly background that I needed to be able to confront those particular issues. And it got to the point to where scholars didn't argue with me anymore. They came to understand that we have an agreement that we just have difference of opinion, which has always been the Islamic faith because they have five different schools of thought. And they don't all agree on everything. And including the idea that of the LGBT community that one says it's, a, it's not punishable, the other four have grown into a, a concept that it is. So it meant that Islam is not a one size fits all philosophy or religion. Taking that information a step further, um, again, I had a vision in 2014 to start Mecca Institute. And it was there that, that in 2015, actually, the organization became um, legal, a legal organization. And it was there that we decided, talking with several other people, uh, professors who work with us and others, that we wanted to build inclusive mosques in the United States, meaning that most mosques you go to, if you're not married, someone runs up to you, I got a daughter, I got a son who wants to get married type of thing, not respecting your own sense of privacy. And therefore, if you didn't accept this invitation or if you didn't eventually accept an invitation for marriage, then something was wrong with you. And that was okay. But through the process of talking, developing, and building inclusive mosques, because there are a few of them in the United States today, we found places where we can go and worship and our sexual orientation had nothing to do with it. But where the faith was in our hearts, how we understood it, and how we interacted with each other in our community. Uh, Mecca Institute continues to play an important role because uh, just last year, in December actually, I released a fatwa, which is a religious opinion, legal opinion, um, and I did something that had now, never been done before, and that was a fatwa on medical marijuana and how it can be utilized for improving people's health. And I've not gotten any re objections to it. I haven't read anything in the papers or the magazines or anything saying that I'm doing something wrong because it's, as a, um, herbal medicine within the Islamic concept has always been permissible, and this is one of the ones that has been. So what it does is it allows people to improve their life. And so Mecca Institute's real goal has always been to fight for something and not fight against something, which is a very different view because most of the time people are fighting, you know, using Islam to fight for, fight against these different isms versus fighting for the development of a greater understanding of the faith a greater understanding of how the different communities should be interacting with each other and not being politicized. Uh, fighting for the ways in which we can be inclusive because the main concept of Islam is taqwa, unification, unity. Yet, throughout all the, ma the majority of mosques, you find there's disunity. So our goal is to make certain that we grow and develop in that way. So, um, in finalizing, and we'll talk, you know, you can ask questions and things, and I can go into more detail. The way in which Islam is now better understood is because of the LGBT community and women who are now, who have women mosques. We have uh, two of them here in the United States, um, one in Canada and one in Germany, um, where the inclusion aspect is there. It doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, what your sexual orientation is, your background, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, you're welcomed in for the process of faith and developing one's faith. So in that way, I think that we're seeing Islam grow. And one final point, in my TED talk I did several years ago, I asked the community that was there present, I said, I have a question for you. 150 years from now, we'll probably have people living on other planets, doing whatever they'll be doing. And I got a question for you. Where do you park your camel? So what that does, just like you, you're like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> that means that we cannot take what was ancient, what from antiquity, 
and project it into the future when none of the context is the same. We can utilize part of the learning. Okay, where do you park your camel? Well, you don't run over people in the street with your cars. So you don't run over people with your you know, rocket jets and stuff. <laughs> but also that we cannot always depend on the past to give us answers for the future. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Dai. And then our third speaker is Jessica Cherry Heiss. Jessica Cherry Heiss is a Hispanic lesbian who's born into the Jehovah's Witness religion and raised as one until she left the religion 12 years ago. Nearly her entire family are currently devout Jehovah's Witnesses and have been for decades. Shortly after leaving, she met her wife and relocated sometime thereafter, starting over with her new life in Baltimore. She has been married for eight years, and she and her partner are raising two young sons. So let's welcome Jessica Cherry Heights. So I'm going to ask you guys to bear with me. I'm coming back from losing my voice, so I'll be drinking a lot of water. Um, so thank you for having me here. Thank you guys for being here to, to listen to our um, panel. Um, there's a lot to say about the religion. There's probably a lot that you all don't know. You probably hear about us knocking on doors, and that might be the extent of it. But there is actually um, a lot of little parts to, to that religion. Um, this is probably a bit more personal than, than the last two speakers. I, my day job is I, I'm an electrical engineering designer, and I work um, for a consulting firm in building engineering. And actually, the last firm I was with worked on this building, so it's kind of cool being back here. <laughs> um, so I'll start with a brief introduction about the religion and then kind of dive into experiences that I had growing up and then what led to my exiting. So the Jehovah's Witnesses are technically a newer religion. They were founded in the uh, late 1800s uh, in Pennsylvania. They do consider themselves one of the um, original Christians that followed the Bible, but somehow end up naming themselves Jehovah's Witnesses um, after Jehovah and the Bible. Um, their founder was Charles T. Russell, and there is, it, it started off called the Christian Congregation, and then they um, became Jehovah's Witnesses. So they, they do consider themselves to be a Christian religion. They believe in Christ, they believe in God, and God is um, the Father of Christ, and they believe that God's name is Jehovah. Uh, one of the things that they don't believe in is the Trinity, and that is something that separates them from other Christian religions, and that they believe that the God, God and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all separate. They never combine those. Um, they also do not, uh, they consider the cross a, an idol, so that you will never see a cross in any of their uh, congregations or in any of their literature. Um, they follow the Bible, but they have their own translation called the New World Translation. And it is a bit more um, basic language than most of the Bibles. And I'd say that when I was an active Jehovah's Witness, the King James Version was probably the, the one that you know is one that I would reference outside of our Bible. Uh, there are about eight and a half million members in about 230 countries or so. And one of their main missions is to spread the word of God. So that is their preaching. That is their number one goal, is to make sure that people know who Jehovah is and what, what good news that they'll spread. So they, they don't um, celebrate holidays or birthdays, which was something that was a little difficult to explain in school when everybody's doing something. And actually now with my kids, uh, it took me a little while to figure out what to do when there's Valentine's Day and Christmas, and I just kind of looked blindly at my wife, like, I don't know what we do here. <laughs> so I'm glad that uh, somebody could help with that. Um, they do not vote or engage in the military. You'll never find one of them as members of Department of Defense. And um, their belief in the afterlife is, they do believe in a heaven, but it's not their belief that that's where most people will go. They believe that there's a select group, um, specifically 144,000, and that number came from Revelation, that will rule in heaven with Christ. And that the majority of 
their population will live in paradise on earth after Armageddon. So they do believe in um, a doomsday. And after that, the world will be cleansed of, of evil and Jehovah's Witnesses will go back to work and trying to repair um, the world. So they do believe that most of the people that will be saved through this are what they call themselves. They feel that they're the true religion will be part of this religion. Um, one of the reasons is that they feel they feel that there are exceptions to people who don't know about God, but people who purposely rebel against God will not be included in that. So that was a little bit scary as a kid to realize, like, my friend Amanda won't be in paradise if, you know, her family is an athe or atheist family. Um, so that's a little bit of the quick synopsis on that. Um, growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, a Jehovah's Witness was a actually a very happy experience. Um, I, had, I was part of a very well-connected community, and I lived in Tampa for most of my life. I'm born in New York, so we were always in a Spanish-speaking congregation, and they're a very close-knit community. Um, and everything you did revolved around the church, um, which they actually call the Kingdom Hall. So they became your friends, your family, and you were discouraged from having any other contacts besides that. So we... We did go to school, but I didn't make friends at school. I had, you know, was polite, and we couldn't really do anything outside of that. Same thing with even family members. You have family members who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses you would be cordial to, but it's not who you hang out with. So I would, I would consider that very similar to the Amish community in that you, everything you do is with them, but we would live, we live among other people. So... Um, I feel that that's one of the one of the things that makes it so hard for people to leave is they kind of wrap you up into everything you have, everything you know is this religion, especially if you're born into it, and you have no support, you have no network. They do not support higher education, which was something that uh, was really hard for me. I did uh, get an associate's degree, and that was kind of like my compromise and feeling, knowing that I would eventually leave, I wanted to pursue a bachelor's uh, in architecture. And they, uh, they gave my parents a hard time for letting their daughter go to school. So they really don't encourage anything beyond high school. And it makes it really difficult to obviously have a career. So if you are too devoted to the career and not enough time towards the ministry, that was something that was looked down upon as well. So leaving there was a huge um, eye-opener because it, you don't know what to do. You're really not uh, taught to plan for retirement. You're, you're taught that Armageddon's coming, so why would you plan for 40 years from now to do anything? Well, 40 years passes, and you're going to retire, and you don't have any money. So uh, there were actually quite a few people that you know, lived with other families and needed help because they didn't know that they would retire. Uh, they do focus, as I said, intensely on extra ministry work. So they encourage their, their youth to pursue full-time ministry. Uh, one of my goals, our family was very, um, it was kind of like an example family in this congregation. My father's an elder, and I wanted to be uh, a servant at Bethel. Bethel is what their headquarters are called, which is out of New York. And I wanted to devote my life to that. And there were some, uh, mostly men, but there are women who serve there as well. And if I didn't get to do that, I wanted to be a missionary um, in another country. So that was my plan. I had no plan for a career and thought was that I would be supported doing this. Um, I was baptized around 12 years old, and you're not baptized until you're able to decide that you can. There have been some as young as nine, but if that's all they know, they, they feel that they can. And I think by between 8 and 12 years old, I knew that I, at some point I would end up having to come out. And I felt that the more I prayed and did all these things, is that I would, I would get it to go, to, way, to go away. So I did what I was told to do. And clearly that didn't help. By 15, I was like, this isn't going to go away. <clears throat> so um, I started thinking about what my life would be like probably around 18 when I what would happen if I left, and ultimately, I, you know, I would have 
you know, my first girlfriend, and then I, I decided I want to go back, and I couldn't face, like, I would lose all my family, I would lose everything I knew, and I would keep going back and forth. And finally, you know, about 12 years ago, I was just like, I can't do this. You know, it's slowly killing me. And um, in fact, there's a high risk of uh, suicide among Jehovah's Witnesses because they face, if they leave, for other reasons besides being gay, but including especially that, that they, they would lose everything. Um, I had a, a friend of mine who uh, died by uh, suicide, and he was gay. And as I didn't, I, I suspected, but I didn't know from him until after he was, uh, after he had passed. And, you know, they wanted to hide the fact that he had died um, by suicide because they just felt like he died because he wasn't serving God. Um, so that um, leads, so soon after I left, I met my wife and we were in a long distance relationship. And eventually I relocated here to, uh, and we got married. and. Uh, it was it was a good move. Event initially, I didn't want to leave. I wanted to be in Florida, but I realize now that Maryland was a much more um, progressive state to be in than Florida, and and it was good to get away from my family. But starting over was really quite uh, an ordeal. In realizing, like I'd have to learn to trust people that weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. I'd have to um, decide what I wanted to do in a career, and I, I got really lucky with engineering, and. So after that, after my uh, brother, shortly after we got married, my older brother passed, passed in a car accident. And that was in 2001, uh, 2011. And it was one of those experiences that um, when something gets so bad that it slaps you in the face and you realize, oh, like, I, I can wake up now. Uh, I, when I went down there, I, I flew down the same night and um, for the service, my brother was very well known in his community. There were about 1,500 people at his service, and people had brought up my marriage. Now, I went down knowing, like, I wasn't going to talk about it. It had just happened. I took my ring off. I just wanted to be there for him, and, you know, I had people telling me how awful it was that I had gotten married, and this was at my brother's funeral, and it was one of those that, like, as terrible as it was, it was a huge wake-up call because I still protected what I knew of them for a long time because I couldn't really let go of it, even though I left. I wanted to be respectful of it, and um, then I realized, like, this isn't, this isn't going to work for you. So that was um, one of those moments that really changed a lot of things for us, um, for my family, and allowing me to let people in, allowing me to have a family of my own. And, you know, soon after that happened, my family did, I was um, informally excommunicated, so at this point, there's no contact with them, which is a very common occurrence, not having any contact with family. So there, I'm, I'm fortunate about my childhood being a really happy one. In a lot of ways, my family was a pretty typical family. But uh, once you start thinking and like having your own ideas, it gets a little harder to, to feel happy um, in something like that, especially as like a teenager. So it has, you know, I have a different relationship with God than I did then and certainly with people that I consider family, which is no longer just blood. Um, and my kids have come to know that as well. But it, it was, um, there's definitely a lot to cover about it, but that's just kind of an insight onto one, one person's personal uh, road on that. So if I would take anything from it, it's, uh, I mean, my biggest lesson from it has been, I've learned about the good in people because I, I thought that that was one thing. And then I realized that people are not what they told me they would be. I was told I would never, I would never be supported, I would never be loved if it wasn't outs inside the Jehovah's Witness religion. And then I realized that that wasn't true. And with every, every crisis or anything that's happened in my life since then, my friends have become my family, have been there. So. You know, if a lot of these things hadn't have happened, I wouldn't have known that. So thank you. Those were three really great presentations. And um, so we're now going to open it up to a question and answer period. And uh, we have a microphone set up here. So if anyone has any questions, 
feel free to um, come up, or I don't know, maybe we could even pass around the microphone if people feel self-conscious about uh, having to come up there to say something. So are there any questions? Thank you all. Very fascinating. My question is for the imam. So you said something about parking your camel, where are you going to park your camel? Yes. That you're, you're looking at things that were in the past that are no longer relevant today. So then why use the book? Well, because it's Oh, and I have the same question about the Bible, too. It's like, we don't slaughter goats anymore to God. Mm -hmm. So why are we using this book? Okay. Um, I think that in my reading the, the Quran several different ways, one, the first time, in the way in which I was told to do it, which was from the start at the beginning and read all the way to the back. But then I learned that there was a way of reading it chronologically. How did the revelation come down? And when I did that, the back of my head blew off. And so I had to be able to put the pieces back together and I had bigger space to think outside of the box. So it's not that the, the text itself has a problem with being contemporary or for the future. It's the people themselves who are limiting the possibilities of those interpretations. So this is why I encourage people to read it chronologically and the way it came down through the prophet so that they can understand this context and what were the lessons that were being taught at the time and can those lessons be utilized in contemporary times and potentially into the future. What has happened is that they've con contextualized it to such a way and where now they have explanations or they have folklore, what they call a hadith which are references as to what the prophet supposedly had done, but the scholars all say that of the 5,000 considered correct or safe um, ahadith, only about 100 of them are historically accurate. So people are believing in a folklore, this mythical image, just like in Christianity, they have a Jesus and then they have a mythical Jesus. So it's the same thing with the prophet Muhammad in a very similar way. And so, when you read the Quran and its contextual understanding, then you can see that it opens up the heart, it opens up the mind. In the same way which the prophet said, or the vision came to him, that when he opened up, you know, went into his closet and then was revealed to him, it took his breath away. And I had a similar experience. And others have told me they've had something similar. But you have to be able to see beyond what people tell you in order for that event to happen. And so the, the book itself, I find, is, is um, a great strength. It's just that how Muslims do it. And one last thing, when I was living in Egypt, my first time in the Middle East, I used to go to a neighborhood mosque. And there was this old guy, probably around 80-some years old. So one day he said to me, I want to talk to you. And I kept going back and back. And then one day I saw him about a month later. And he said to me, he said, I want to tell you something. Follow the Quran. Don't do as you see other Muslims do. If you follow the Muslims, you'll ruin your faith. And I took that to heart. Hi. Um, I had a question for you. Um, where do you stand with your family now? I, uh, yeah. Thank you. So for the past uh, nine years or so, I have had very limited contact with uh, any of my family that's Jehovah's Witnesses, for the exception of, with the exception of my mother. And about a year ago, she uh, ended that relation, the rest of that relationship as well. She, she felt too torn and conflicted with what she felt was the right thing to do for her. And so at this point, um, I, I speak with my grandmother, and she's kind of a little bit like, what the hell? I mean, I'm going to speak to my grandkid. But uh, other than that, I don't really have contact with any of them anymore. Family relationships can be challenging under the best of circumstances, and as the extra layers of religion teaching people what they should and shouldn't do with their kids is, is it forces them, as you say, into like internal conflict, similar to not the same as, but similar to what LGBT people face in our own navigating family and church and whatever else. Um, I would say that 
it is in part a parent's journey and a family member's journey to figure out how to navigate that for themselves. And each family member might do that differently. Um, so if there are people who are in the middle of muck with their family for rejection reasons, uh, I would say seek support elsewhere while they figure out their own path. For uh, the nice young lady in the Adventist church, you brought up something really interesting. I didn't know you said in 95 that uh, it was thought that women could no longer serve as elders. Damn, I'm sorry, I took that wrong. Oh, that being said, I was just wondering how did that affect the faith? Thank you. So I'll clarify. In 95, they were thinking about who could be ordained as, as pastors. And so in, in that decision, they actually decided that women could be elders. So my mother was one of the first cohort of elders in the British Union Conference and in the mid-90s. And But there is still some ambivalence about it across the globe. So in, the North, in North America, I will see uh, women as elders in various congregations. And we attend a church where there is a woman minister, um, one of four, uh, the other guys are men. And, um, but there's still conflicts around it. And every five years when the global church meets again, it usually comes up again and it's a big controversy. What the, one of the impacts is that people not having visible instances or examples of females in, in leadership, it has an impact on people who are women and it has an impact on people who understand themselves as men and anybody else otherwise gendered. Because if you don't see an example, it's hard for you to imagine yourself in a, in a particular role or position. And so that was definitely true for me. Like I never imagined that there could be women who were ministers um, until I met them and started to advocate for them. Because uh, if you feel a call in a particular denominational tradition, you should be free to express that call. Um, I think another of the impacts is teaching people that it's okay to maintain patriarchal understandings of how people should relate to each other. So if you value uh, ministers above clergy, which I don't think you should do, but if you do that, then it teaches you to value one gender over another implicitly and, and by how you allocate power to those people who have a collar or whatever. Like there has, um, there are social impacts from that decision to close off access to a profession to only one gender. Oh, yeah, I, and I just want to add something to that, too, um, and then I'll, I'll um, call on Professor Wilkinson next, um, which is that, you know, I was also really struck by the diversity and the globalization aspects of each of your talks. And so, you know, with Keisha, you know, you really talked a lot about colonization, and um, Dai, you talked about your travels internationally, and Jessica, you talked about your, you know, aspirations of wanting to be a, becoming a missionary when you were young. And so I just kind of want to throw that into kind of the um, pool in terms of what we're discussing right now. So, um, yes, Professor Wilkinson, can, can you? journey even in high school, right, and then studying in China and, and throughout the Middle East. Um, but both of the other speakers actually spoke to very, very tight-knit, um, ethnically homogenous um, groups, even though the religion as a whole is quite diverse. And I wondered if, if you would comment on that a bit. Uh, when, when did you, you were saying, I didn't know there were white Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> what about Ellen White? <laughs> 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 So that, that's a good point, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to elaborate on, actually. So I grew up in, a, in an area where there were a lot of Hispanics, and my parents raised us speaking Spanish first, and um, we luckily had a congregation that spoke Spanish, but we stayed in there until I was about 17, and my younger brother had a hard time speaking Spanish after you know being born here, and he's just like, I can't keep up. So we did 
moved to an English-speaking one. And I'd say in the Tampa Bay area, now that the Spanish-speaking congregations have surpassed all the others. But um, they are, everywhere my parents travel, they find a Kingdom Hall. And they go and they meet the, the they call them brothers and sisters. Um, but I, I had a hard time. I knew the scriptures in Spanish. I didn't know them in English. Um, there are some, you know, Bible books that they sound similar, so you know what they are. But it was hard for me to do preaching work in English, even though everything else in my life I spoke in English, except for at home. But at school I spoke English, and and then I had a hard time at church. But they they consider themselves to to love past any race, ethnic background, and they have these conventions every year. Um, they have local ones where you would go, and, and it's you know usually a couple hours drive. But they do have international conventions where they get together many of the countries. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses representing those countries, and only a few from each country could go. But they you know they have translators there, and um, that's I've heard is a for them a pretty awesome experience because they can see what this looks like around the globe. I think structurally, um, Adventism is, is similar to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Both, we started at the same time, roughly the same time, and I think there were some early co collaborations between the founders once upon a time. Um, I would say that in the US anyway, there's the fact that Adventism arose in the 1840s and then organized as a denomination in the 1860s. It was just in time for the US Civil War where segregation between black and white races particularly was really like a fundamental part of society. And there were some early disagreements about whether the early churches or congregations should be mixed ethnically. And the um, pragmatic answer at that time was mix where you can and where people are racist, don't bother so that you don't attract negative attention. So that was the compromise at the time and how it's um, been worked out in the centuries since is the US began a system where it had a parallel structure for black congregations and white congregations in the 1940s. And that happened after an incident down the street in Maryland where uh, a black woman, a light-skinned black woman attempted to go to an Adventist hospital and when they discovered she was black, she was turned away and she eventually died. And after that incident, the church administratively split. So then you might come up in a, in a congregation that is in a, a majority white congregation, a, a majority white conference, and you might have um, uh, Latinx immigrants and you might have um, white folks and you might have some Caribbean immigrants. But if you go into the black congregations, it's largely gonna be um, Americans, American blacks, and some, uh, some Caribbean folks as well. Um, so you'll see people having a diversity of experiences and depending on the congregation that they come up in, but there'll be a lot of mixing in the colleges and universities and a lot of mixing now that we're maturing in the, in the medical industry as well. So it, it varies a lot in the US. There was something I, I wanted to add to that. Um, one of the things in the US, what I noticed with the preaching work is that it tends to attract immigrants, uh, and part of that is that uh, people who are, who are here and they're not established and they don't have a community, that draws them to a group like Jehovah's Witnesses. They're very warm and loving and they, you know, they bring you in and they provide for you and, and in a lot of ways, maybe not materially, but almost all the other ways that they can. So um, when, when we were preaching in Florida um, around the time of Hurricane Katrina, we had a lot of people that were here from, they were in Florida from Louisiana and they, uh, that suddenly we had a lot of Bible studies um, for people who were out of state and they found that they needed to reach out to God and we were actively appearing there at their door. So um, I, f I find that in the, in the states you will find more um, diversity than you would um, people who were born and raised here and they have their own you know roots. So we have a little more time. Any more questions? Uh, so I guess this is a question for all of you. Do you find that you get a lot of opposition because you belong to the LGBTQ community within your own religious sectors? Do you find that that's very difficult to navigate? Or do you kind of have your own communities where 
it can be easier to, I guess, coexist. Um, in in the religion I was part of, there there is no mixing. If you are found to be actively gay and you're living your lifestyle the way you want to, you're out. So I am now part of um, a group that started off being called a common bond, but it's really this uh, LGBT group that uh, is all former Jehovah's Witnesses or, or some that are seeking to leave. And that Facebook group has between 1,500 and 2,000 members world, worldwide. Uh, worldwide. And so that's a, it was a good resource, especially at the beginning, to see that there was, there was this whole world out there, people who would support me. But it, I did not find it within the organization. And more of my support comes from, from people who never knew the religion, honestly. Um, yeah, I think I've had, I've had a, I had a hard first decade after I recognized I was bi. And it was mostly around trying to navigate local churches where I'd been really active and like had been preaching and teaching and whatever, and also trying to navigate the family attachment to the church. So again, I said my grandfather converted in the thirties, my grandparents did, and within a generation, they had all become ordained elders. And so for them, the church became the center around which the family organized itself. And so even now, if we have reunions, there will be family worship every evening. So it's part of the, the family pattern, and it's, it's very difficult for any members. My cousins, maybe 60% of us, have a fluxy relationship with the church. But it's hard for any of us to navigate that, even as adults. Um, at the same time, I was able to find community with a group called Seventh-day Adventist Kinship International, which is a, an LGBT affinity group within the Seventh-day Adventist community. And it's not endorsed by the denomination, but there are many members who are still active uh, members of the church. And so m most of the people who can try to stay, because as Jessica said, and as, as Adai has said, like there are benefits to being part of religious community. And if people are able to thread the needle on what will make it work for them without dehumanizing them every time they engage, like they should do that. Um, but the SDA kinship allowed me to connect with uh, queer people who were either still in the denomination or had found some way to integrate sexuality and religion outside or had moved on from religion entirely, but was still most of them pretty stable lives. And I didn't want to be in a circuit where there was a lot of um, like negative or maladaptive behavior, people either going into addictions to cope with the stress. I didn't want any of that. So it was a, it was a good like point for me to be able to find people who were asking the same sort of questions I was asking and try to make sure I still had community even when things were hard with my family. Um. I sort of want to approach that question, or your question, uh, slightly differently. It's not really the outside opposition that has ever been a problem for me, because I'm, I'm not someone you can intimidate, you know, physically or intellectually. Um, so often, like I said in my sp um, conversation, that part of the thing is that we came to agree to disagree, that I have this particular opinion supported by the same thing that you said is different, but yet I have a different interpretation. You know, sometimes it's the numbers game, you know, because everybody believes it, then it must be true. Well, if that's the case, then how is it that our prophets throughout time and God, two together, wipe out all that other? <laughs> so it's those kinds of logical conclusions that help you deal with those issues. But what I find the most difficult is that within our own LGBTQ family, there's a lot of trauma there. And so it's very difficult to get through the trauma with people. It's a numbers game sometimes. <laughs> and it's difficult. But I find that I, by supporting them through encouraging them to have certain types of standards, it's not what you do, but how you do it. So don't talk to me about being a good Muslim when you're doing all the, the things that are evil towards other human beings. You know, you're not a good Muslim if you do that. So it's keeping, maintaining those particular standards. And it doesn't bother me, because people, you know, at a time, I've had a real difficulty with um, 
polygamy. Um, not just because it was done on the heterosexual side, but also on the queer side. But I found that if people are in agreement with each other, and that's one of the standards of Islamic marriage, is that people are in agreement that this is what they want to do, then do what you want to do, as long as everybody's aware. But if you're sneaking around and doing, then I have, where are your scruples, you know, in terms of that? So I think one of the issues that's coming forward and I think what's happening is that we have to have more discussions about our com within our own community, the internal issues, so that as we become more congealed and better associated, then we can then deal with the outer community in a much stronger position. Now, I'm 66 years old and, you know, have 51 years of being involved in the queer community, and I still see that we have problems within our own community with language. We have to learn to, to stop and talk to each other about the language. I was talking with a transgender person a few years ago, and I told them, you know, they were saying, well, you're using the wrong language, and you're calling it. I said, hold on a second. Now, when Peter was transitioning to Karen in 1971, <laughs> you see, so I know what the issues are, but maybe I'm using the wrong language. So let's talk about the context, and if I'm using the wrong language, teach me then I'm better able to explain my experience and those things which you are now experiencing today, but in a different context. So this is why I'm saying sometimes we have to do our own internal work in order for us to become more jailed, you know, more congealed. And then that way we move forward as a community within our own context. Okay, I think we're just about at the end of our time. So I'd like to again thank our panelists for wonderful discussion. Um.